Yeah, I mean, look, everybody has the things that they're uncomfortable with. Like, I don't like heights. Mm. You know, roller coasters aren't my things. I'm never going to parachute. That, to me, I don't understand why you would ever jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Yep. Uh, but I'm not really too concerned about a few bee stings. Um, and other people are petrified of the idea. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Here in L.A., Harbor Gateway Edition. Today we talk with a beekeeper. This man grew up in Harbor Gateway near Long Beach, traveled the world, building TV stations and studios. He got hitched, had kids, and a few years ago decided to get tens of thousands of bees. Now he has over 100,000. He put me in a suit, he walked me back there, he took off the lid, we saw the bees. Later I ate the honey. Best honey I've ever had in my life. Michael is his name. He's got a TikTok where he had one of his videos go viral where over 10 million people watched him turn a bad bee scene into a beautiful rescue. We'll get into all of that and more. So please welcome Michael Pusateri. Hey, everybody. I am here with Michael Pusateri. Very good. Well done. Is that how you say it? Yeah, you did it right. Michael Pusateri from Sicily. No, I'm not. (laughs) It's a Sicilian name. I was born and raised in L.A. Where were you born? I was born at the uh, Kaiser Hospital down near the harbor. You were really born in Harbor City? Well, not in Harbor City proper, but down there in Torrance where the Kaiser Hospital is down there. That's awesome. Okay. And and that is Harbor City, for those of you who don't know, is really close to Long Beach. Right. The uh, L.A. City and its political machinations all those years ago um, had this thing called the Harbor Gateway, which connected kind of downtown L.A. with the San Pedro Harbor so they could control the docks down there. And so they had a little area that they built out called Harbor City, um, which was just a bunch of neighborhoods that connected the Harbor Gateway. And uh, I grew up in a housing development down there and uh, went to Narbonne High School in Harbor City. When you say housing development, like the projects? Not really the projects, but back in the, uh, believe it or not, in the like early 70s, like all of L.A. wasn't developed yet. So there was still open land all over the place. So some of it was in the Harbor Gateway. Uh, If you go over to Carson, there's still some open land over there. Um, And so the developers were going in and they're putting in these brand new neighborhoods of inexpensive housing on that land because who wants to live in this Harbor Gateway? (laughs) Uh, And so in 1972, my parents bought a house there. um, And uh, that's where I grew up. My mom still lives there. So did it look like a suburban neighborhood? Totally suburban. Mm -hmm. It was all like, you know, all the houses looked exactly the same and Um, The streets are all curvy and we would play games out in the street and like car coming, you know, all that kind of stuff. You went to high school at Narbonne? Narbonne High, which currently is a huge football powerhouse of L.A. um, as far as public schools go. And um, but when I was there in the early 80s, we were not powerhouses. Um, How close were you to um, we all know that Snoop Dogg and Cameron Diaz grew up right around there. How close were you to their high school? Um, Well, I think Snoop was over in Long Beach, so that was across the Vincent Thomas Bridge. So we didn't go over there a whole lot, but we would often head down to San Pedro because there were pizza places there that would sell beer out the back door to underage kids. Yes. And then we would kind of drive a little further up to the wilderness (laughs) of uh, Portuguese Ben in PV where we would pull over and drink beers late into the night. What What a perfect childhood. Drinking and driving. Uh, drinking and driving. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the 80s were a very special time in American history. <laughs> um, those of us who didn't grow up in California, we just assumed there was just a lot of weed. Was there weed in Arbonne High School? Uh, there definitely was. Um, we had one of the big stories was that there was the uh, narc that went undercover as a student and then busted people at your high school at our high school because we were not you know we're not we weren't super high up the socioeconomic ladder so they weren't going to offend any politicians children by arresting them so did you cross paths with this narc 
no, I didn't, I didn't hang in that circle. You know, that wasn't my thing. I was into, you know, Dungeons and Dragons and uh, science fiction books and running track at the time. So, well, okay. Today, and for the last 30 years, you've been an engineer. Right. So I went to call engineering school and I graduated as a electrical engineer. And in 1989, uh, there was a plethora of jobs for engineers. And I had like five job offers to go be uh, work in the defense industry. And there was one job offer to go work in television. And my father said, he was an engineer. He said, well, take the job in TV because they always need TV, but the defense industry depends who's president. So I took a job in TV and I've been a television engineer since then to this day. You know, God bless your dad. Um, but that seems like a, I wouldn't have advised you for that because first of all, the whole South Bay wasn't that built around defense? Yeah, my dad worked. Uh, he was an engineer, and he worked in the aerospace industry. And um, <laughs> didn't believe in it. He he worked at TRW. He worked at Huge Aircraft. He would help design radar stuff for the military. And then he went into business selling a bunch of stuff that was used in all that, like electronic warfare stuff. So he knew he knew the businesses, and he advised me to stay out of it. I would think that those were the guys that would make the most money, though. The engineers. Well, at the time, it was, you know, today we're living in an era where you hear about these Facebook engineers or a Google engineer is making all this money. And it's somehow there's a bunch like a, a cult around the concept of the 10x engineer and all this stuff. But when I went to school, we viewed ourselves as more like uh, of service to people, right? Like we built your bridges and we made sure your house was safe and we made sure your cars and we made sure the wiring in your house was good. Um, so there was a very different attitude about what engineering was at the time. Um, I had spent my summers in college doing electronic warfare stuff um, as, as, a, as a, a student. So I kind of knew what that was about and it didn't seem very exciting. But working in television was a brand new thing for me. And, you know, it, it, it sounded thrilling at the time to go be in TV. What was your first gig in TV? I worked for a company that built TV facilities and radio facilities. So at the time, if you wanted a TV station or you wanted a radio station edit room, you would pay someone to come in and wire up all this special equipment. And these are in the days before kind of general purpose computers. So a specialized knowledge. And uh, I was the young unmarried engineer. So they would not think twice of go to Florida and build this for several weeks wow. and live out of a hotel or... Um, a big thing I did, I spent uh, over six months in San Francisco building KQED's TV and radio station back in 91 wow. um, because I, I didn't have any any ties. And so they were like, go have fun in San Francisco. I love that. I it love was that. good for a while until I met uh, the woman who became my wife. How long have you guys been married? It'll be, I think, 28 years Wow. in uh, May. And looking around your home here, it's very artistic, and it, you seem to be giving all the credit to that to her. Well, she's the one who went to art school and got her graduate degree in photography and while I was in engineering school. So we kind of have split the difference that she defers to me on how to set up the computers <laughs> and you know fix things, and I defer to her on what art do we put on our walls, and uh, she makes a lot of the decisions for us. Do you think that's a good balance for a couple that that one person is let's let's call it more logical and the other person is more artistic? Well, I wouldn't say she's not logical. I would I never know, I, I would know. never say anything that <laughs> would take away from her capabilities. I, I think the tough thing is it, it's very it works very well, but you have to kind of uh, to be clinical sublimate your ego, right? You have to be willing to say. I put my faith in this other person. I'm okay. If you look down the hall, you'll see walls painted this kind of baby blue. I came home one day and there was a painter here painting the walls blue. And you have to be okay that you have given up of yourself the that they're just going to do things and you, you can be okay with it. <laughs> so I think that's the trick. Some people, they want a lot more control in their life about every little thing. And... Um, I think that's the trick. Does an engineer just want white walls no matter where he goes? Or do you even care about the color of the walls? I have my own like preferences, 
but it doesn't matter as much to me as it does to her. So um, I'm fine with it, right? As I would, you know, my I've learned that a happy wife is a happy life. So I'm, I'm much more willing to go with the blue walls in the hallway. Okay, well, one thing that, that you do that may raise the eyebrows of other wives in the world is somehow you've, you've, you have a hobby about beekeeping. How did you, how did you get this hobby? Like, how do you fall into beekeeping? Um, it's a great question. Um, I have a lot of different hobbies that I have run through that uh, my wife, Michelle, has had to put up with over the years. <laughs> Um, and, um, hopefully most of them are legal. They're, they're all pretty much legal. Um, but it's everything from, you know, how do you build a meat smoker out of a trash can, um, uh, video games, uh, 3d printing. You got a 3d printer in here? I show you it's in the garage. Oh, nice. Um, so a lot of nerdly hobbies that I have and, and, uh, when our girls uh, grew up and were older and moved out. Um, as empty nesters, uh, you know, I'm, I was told to keep busy. So, um, there's only so much she wants of me in the house all the time. So I had started talk thinking about beekeeping cause it's an interesting mix of kind of the physical engineering of the boxes and how everything works. Um, and then you get this product, you get this honey at the end. And I found that really interesting and I could do it in my backyard. So um, I told Michelle I was interested in this and she wasn't very game for it. And then uh, we had that discussion with my youngest daughter who went to college to study uh, horticulture and entomology. And entomology, as you know, is a study of insects. And when the youngest daughter said, mom, this would be great, uh, it was instantly turned to me that why haven't you started the beekeeping already? This is, this is a go. And so uh, in 2018, I started doing beekeeping in the backyard. Were you not afraid of being stung? No, I, I, I know a lot of people have a lot of fear about bees. It was never a top of mind concern of mine. Um, so you, you went headfirst into beekeeping. Yeah. I mean, look, everybody has the things that they're uncomfortable with. Like I don't like heights, mm. you know, roller coasters aren't my things. Mm -hmm. I'm never going to parachute that to me, I don't understand why you would ever jump out of a perfectly good airplane. Yep. Uh, but I'm not really too concerned about a few bee stings. Um, and other people are petrified of the idea. So you say you started this hobby in 2018. Yeah. Here we are in 2022. So it's been about four years. Yep. How many times have you been stung by bees? I couldn't count them all. A lot. Yeah. Do any of them, are any of them like super painfully hurt? Uh, the pain really isn't the thing. Um, what I have learned, uh, as you can see, I have rings on my ring fingers on both hands. You're married to two women. Interesting. Well, the, my right hand ring is a ring that, well, it's the one of the series of rings I was given for Father's Day. So on my first Father's Day, uh, Michelle gave me a ring for my right hand oh. that was from her and our, first, our oldest daughter. Um, I was in a cycling accident and my hand arm swelled up and they had to cut that ring off. So she got me a replacement. <laughs> And then many years later, uh, I got a bee sting on that ring finger, three stings on that one finger, and it started to swell up. So they had to cut the ring, that ring off again. So you're looking at the third version of my Father's Day ring. Is it true that when a bee stings you, it dies? Oh, absolutely, yeah. So this is a, almost a kamikaze mission by the bee. That they, they fear their own death, so they're willing to be suicidal? Well, uh, bees aren't people, so they don't think, right? Oh. So I know because we've watched movies, you think that the bees are making some decision based on the chat they had with the other bees, <laughs> but bees don't think. So they're not like humans, and it's difficult, I think, for us to kind of rationalize that you have a creature who really bees are driven by smells. Oh. Um, very, if you think about it, inside a beehive, it's completely dark all the time. Mm -hmm. And so everything is by smell and touch. And so when bees think there's a threat, they'll release this alarm pheromone, which tells them defend. And they defend by stinging. 
and they're not thinking of consequences because they don't really think they're just reacting and so if i appear to be a threat to them they will sting me because that's their job as one of 30,000 bees bees don't think they're there to protect the hive number one the queen number two or is it reversed um well they want to they want to reproduce and pass on their genetics so the best way to think about bees is a colony of bees is a super organism you have to think about it is you're really concerned about the overall colony of bees not any one individual thing of bees one reason we're talking about bees is you're famous now on TikTok. Well, I don't know if I would use the word famous. Okay, how many followers do you have on your TikTok? 75,000. <laughs> Are you showing your ass on TikTok? Uh, well, no, I haven't done the little drop video yet, but I can, I can do that if you want. I do want. Okay. They're there to see you handle bees, right? Yeah, so a couple videos I've done have gone viral. There was one of me rescuing some bees out of a water meter, and that has over 10 million views. 10 million? Yeah. Do you get paid for any of this? It's peanuts. It's, you know. For 10 million views? Yeah, it's, uh, if you want to make money, you got to be on basically Facebook. Facebook pays the most, YouTube pays next, and TikTok is basically. Are you on Facebook and YouTube? I'm not trying to make money off of any of this, though. It's a look if you get into the whole world of influencers and the people who make a profession out of this stuff, it becomes a full time job. And uh, I already have a full time job. Yeah, you do. OK, so tell me about the 10 million uh, view video. What was it about? Uh, well, I uh, Michelle was out for a walk one day and she walked by a water meter and there's a little hole on a water meter and bees were coming in and out. And she's seen enough of what I do that she told me, hey, I think there's a bunch of bees in this water meter. So I went back a couple days later and sure enough, there's, I could tell there were bees down there. I talked to the owner of the house in front of it and said, I think you have bees. Do you want me to get them out? And he was like, sure. So <laughs> I came one day and I took the bees out and I took them home to put them in a colony. And when I do my normal bee work of inspecting them every weekend or every other weekend, anything I do, I videotape it to kind of remember exactly what I did and make videos for people to watch. I've been a blogger as you know, you and I have known each other, bumped into each other probably over 20 years of the world of blogging. Right. So I've kind of been okay with documenting the kind of things I do. Yeah. So whether it's here, I'm going to make ribs or I'm going to make a drink or I'm going to do bees. I kind of record it and put it up on the internet for people to see. Never thinking that it would go viral. No, no, not at 10 million views. And um, <laughs> so I made a video of, of me rescuing these bees and I put it up on TikTok and somehow it triggered the almighty TikTok algorithm. And suddenly, you know, the notifications went just to 11 and um, it was off the charts. And um, I got comments. The, the time I knew it was very different than anything before is the comments stopped being all in English and suddenly I had Russian comments, Chinese comments, Greek, French, Italian, Russian, like everything. And it had gone global in people looking at it. That's and, the best. Yeah, it, I felt um, they all, people have, not everywhere in the world has water meters the way we do in the United States. <laughs> so a lot of people thought I was looking in the sewer and pulling the bees out of the sewer. So when I would translate their comments so I could read it, they would call it sewer honey. And I was like, I wanted to like reach out to the person. It's not, not sewer. It's, it's clean water. So in the next video, when I talked about questions people had, I had a whole page that was just in many languages that said, this is clean water in all these different languages so they didn't think it was the sewer. Would 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 bees uh make sewer honey? Or do, even they know that you need clean water to, to make good honey. Um well the bees make honey out of flower nectar, right? So that's the main thing that they're after. So they um they get their carbohydrates from uh nectar and they get their protein from pollen. So that's why they love flowers. That's why flowers and all plants love bees. Um, that's the deal. Like um, we'll put out nectar and pollen 
and you insects come and pollinate it so we can make more plants. And then the bees take the nectar and the pollen back to the hive and they use it to raise more bees. And the bees know that winter comes, like doesn't come for us very much in LA, but the re a lot of the world, it gets cold and there's no flowers. So honey is the bees saying, winter's coming, I'm gonna store food for the winter. And they store as much of it as they can. And so luckily for us humans, they store so much that we can take some of that honey for ourselves and the bees survive and they can do it again the next year. And you were nice enough to give me a honey bear filled with cruft apiary wildflower honey. Yes. How, okay, so this thing is, let's say, four inches, four inches big. How many ounces would you say this is? It's just under a pound of honey. A pound of honey. How many of these little bears do you think you produce in your backyard? Well, last year was the first year I got any serious amount of honey, and I got about just over 80 pounds of honey out oh of the bees. God. Is this a household that eats a lot of honey? No, I mean, we put it in our tea. We might cook with it a little bit, but um, mainly we just give it away to friends and family. <laughs> I mean, it's great. It's great to think this is L.A. produced wild bees. Are they wild if they're in your backyard? Well, they're not really wild because I control the queen's genetics. Oh. Right. So um, what you want are bees that are calm and produce a lot of honey and don't attack people or animals. So um, when you hear about things called Africanized bees, what they really are is a species of bees that came out of Africa that we would refer to as beekeepers as the Sculetta genes. Mm. And they're more aggressive. They're very hardy. They're tough. Um, and they have slowly worked their way into Southern California. Really? That's yeah. all real? Oh, yeah. But, but they then, haven't taken over. Every time that they talk about Africanized bees, it's like a big panic. Well, you know, I, I've worked in television a very long time. <laughs> and if it bleeds, it leads, right? Like controversy <laughs> sells. So if, if you think you're going to do a story about killer bees, you got to make it sound like these people's life's in danger. They'll turn to a different channel. <laughs> So what the Sculetta genes do is they make them a bit more aggressive, right? Mm. And so there are bees all around you, no matter what neighborhood you live in in L.A. I hear there's a lot of them. Um, there are bees there, and most of them are living in trees or a water meter, and they would re we refer them as feral bees where no one is managing them in any way. Mm. And so the Sculetta genes can be there, and they can be aggressive. So when I go and rescue a hive, I'm pretty sure, well, I don't know what the genes are of that hive. And uh, so if we go out later today for you to see the bees, yeah. you can see one of the colonies that I'm concerned that it has um, not a, a queen from a known genetics that I like, and they can be a little bit aggressive. You may have Africanized bees in your backyard. Oh, well, almost all bees have some Sculetta genes in them. So, oh. so every bee you see at every flower, it's probably going to have some of it. It's when you're near their hive, the box that they live in, that they'll become very defensive. When they're out scouting and foraging, they're not much to worry about. And so if, if you do determine that this is a bad bee, you're going to have to kill her. Well, the queen is what you're after because the queen is the mother to all of the bees in the colony. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we go in and we find the queen, the feral queen, as we would call it. We mm -hmm. put her in a special clip, take her away, yep. uh, make her a great ancestor, XB. And then we <laughs> usually get from people who raise queens with the genetics that are um, good for, um, they're, they're, they don't attack, they're not very aggressive. They make a lot of honey, and especially down for beekeepers, they can handle the varroa mites. So the big challenge for beekeepers over the last 20 years have been these varroa mites, which are parasites that are really detrimental to the bee populations all over. So one of the good things that you're doing back here is you are making, well, how many bees do you think you got back there? Well, right now there's four, four colonies back there. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger ones probably have... 40 to 50,000 bees in them. The smaller ones probably have 20 to 30,000 bees. So there's probably well over 100,000 bees back there. Okay, you mentioned mites 
Now, I, I dated a girl who had um, uh, iguanas. Yeah. And she was always like picking mites off of this poor iguana. Right. Because they could kill iguanas. Sure. Mites somehow are not afraid of bees. Well, uh, the kind of mites we're talking about are called Varroa Destructor. And, Great uh, name. Yes. So uh, they are a parasite on honeybees that is very detrimental to them. Mm. And they arrived in America around 30 years ago and have spread to become where they're endemic. So these... So, so Bush let these... these these are these mites in? I, I don't think the president was responsible I don't for, know. for these I don't things. Know. So uh, the mites um, uh, bite into the bees, wow. both when they're in the like cocoon, when they're a brood becoming a bee, and later when they're walking around. And then what happens is they've basically cut a hole in the exoskeleton of the bee, and oh. viruses come in, and they do viruses do bad things to the bee. So this is just one of the many things that bees are facing these days that has people concerned about them. So we, um, we took a little journey into your backyard and I saw four boxes of bees and you swear there's a hundred thousand bees in these things. Yes. It, it, I, I'm saying it that way because it doesn't look like there's a lot of bees. Well, later we're going to put you in a suit. We'll take you out back. I'm going to open these up. And I'm going to count them. <clears throat> and the scales will fall away from your eyes, my friend. <laughs> um, is your wife okay with having 100,000 bees in your backyard? Yes. Because she trusts that you know how to handle them. Well, the youngest daughter said we should keep bees, so that's a big plus in my side. <laughs> and then um, uh, we've been able to handle them when we had an aggressive colony where she was trying to do her... Uh, dye work outside and uh, she couldn't and I was able to swap out the queen and make it all better so she feels that it is manageable at this point. Um, I saw a little shade that you made on top of it all. Yeah. Sun bothers bees? Direct sunlight? No, they, they like the sun. It's how they orient and they, they don't mind the heat at all. Uh, I put that up when it was kind of, we had a bunch of rain a few months ago where it kind of rained all week. I didn't want the rain directly on the hives. Um, it's very nice of you. Time, so, does um, do does the local government care if you have a hundred thousand bees in your backyard? So, I think most cities are kind of open up the regulations. Some sometimes they had kind of banned them completely. Los City of Los Angeles used to have a total ban on beekeeping. They've gone back. You can have bees now, according to them. Um, the city I live in, South Pasadena, allows you to have bees. Um, you are required by the county or state to register your bees. Mm. Um, so um, the ag department of, I think the LA County Ag Department, I registered my bees with them. It's mainly not so much that they come and tell me what I'm doing wrong. It's that if they're going to be doing any kind of spraying of pesticides, oh. you could be notified and then you could close up the hives to protect your bees from the pesticides in the area. I think I reached out to you many years ago when there was something on social media about these newfangled beehive backyard contraptions. The flow hive, yes. Was that you that I reached out to? Probably. Okay. So this made it seem like it was an easy way for amateurs to get free honey. And I don't think you were crazy about this contraption. The flow hive. I'm being very careful how I phrase this because the flow hive is quite controversial in the beekeeper community. I would imagine that the traditionalists. It's not so much about the traditionalists not wanting an easier way to get honey because getting honey is a arduous process. Mm -hmm. The issue is more of misleading someone who they may think that if you just buy this thing, you just seven months later, honey squirts out and the flow hive is a really interesting, as an engineer, very interesting innovation in how they make it work where you don't have to do as much work to get the honey out, but it doesn't alleviate any of the very hard work of keeping the bees healthy, make sure they're growing the right way, avoiding swarms, all the beekeeping stuff is not gone at all. You simply save on this last bit part of how do you get the honey out of the honeycomb. So you would recommend to amateur or would-be beekeepers just do it the way it's been done for a long time. 
Well, not so much that. I think everybody should choose their own path. It's more you should learn how to just raise bees and be a beekeeper before you really get into the subtleties of how do you want to harvest your honey, right? So it's like learning to drive a car, right? When you're first learning to drive a car, step one is, can I drive the simplest car and obey the laws? And that might take you a year or two to get comfortable with that. And then you could start saying, hey, I'm a truck person, or I'm an off-road person, or I'm a sports car person. And then you start making choices based on your experience. And I think with beekeeping, it should be the similar thing. Can I deal with raising these bees and all the work that goes into it before you get caught up in the, how am I going to harvest this honey? So when, when I imagine now your neighbors know that you're the beekeeper guy. Yes. And if, if their water meter gets in trouble with bees, they'll call you or they'll notify you and somehow and you take the bees and you bring them over here in the next couple of years do you imagine you'll have 200,000 300,000 bees in your backyard no there, there's been an agreement in the household that four <laughs> four colonies of bees is our our limit so i've agreed to that so um oh so you're at the limit then yeah so i i um i rescued a colony a swarm actually from some neighbors uh, about a half mile away. I brought them home to the house. I then contacted someone in our local bee club that wants bees and he drove and picked up the bees and now he's happily has a free, free, free swarm of bees. There's a bee club. There's a club for everything, my friend. <laughs> so uh, I am a proud member of the Los Angeles County Beekeepers Association that's been going for over a hundred years. I don't know why I'm like, I just think it's super cute that there's a bee club. Is it there's cute? A, Are these really sweet people? They're good people. They're like any club about a hobby in which you mix a lot of different experiences. So you get some really interesting conversations about, let's say, technology. So you have a uh, a bunch of beekeepers who don't like the internet. They don't have, you know, they don't have smartphones. And then suddenly you thrust them into the pandemic in which they're told you're going to have your beekeeping meeting, not at the church where we normally have our meetings. It's going to be on zoom. Oh. And so then you have people like me who kind of work with technology regularly, uh, having our brain melt, watching these other people trying to use <laughs> video conferencing for the first time. Let's okay. Let's talk about your real job real quick. Okay, you um, you work at NBC in um, Universal City. Yes, is Universal City a neighborhood? Well, I don't know how you define it. It's on the map as Universal City. I don't think it's a city though. Well, I'll leave that up to you to well, do research you're, on. You're, you're more logical than I am. I would think a city needs its own police force, maybe, maybe even a fire department. Is there a fire department at Universal City? Uh, Universal Studios has its own fire right. station. Because of you want to protect all the tourists. Well, there's a lot of things there. If you remember probably 15, 20 years ago, there was a fire at the vault on the Universal lot. Yeah. And the first people that responded were the fire station that is on the lot. Yeah. Disney has its own fire station as well, right down the road. Um, Disney Animation, that that uh, campus. Yeah, the main Disney Studio lot. Right. Um, and you would know that because you've worked there before. I spent sixteen years being a cast member under the mouse. You're is that what they call the employees, cast members? Yes, yes. You really felt it too. You felt that you were a cast member. Oh, absolutely. How like, so? Um. Well, I worked on the television side, obviously, and helped build out the Disney Channel and a bunch of the cable stuff. But when we would go to the theme park, either as part of a business thing or when I would go with my family to the theme park, you didn't want to see litter because you were part of it and you would want to pick that up or you would want to fix things. And uh, Disney is in the news a lot now about their culture. But one of the things I think makes me feel so passionate that are working for Disney now about why they're upset is you definitely feel like you are part of it uh, in a much stronger way than any other company I've worked for. Hmm. 
Um, so you did feel like you were part of it and you were connected to it and the reflection on one bad part of the company reflected on you and what you did. Mm. And not a lot of companies have that feeling. Especially giant companies. I mean, that's a giant international. Yeah. Yeah. So you think that the people that work at the Tokyo uh, Disneyland have the same passion for making Disney as a company? Oh, absolutely. I, I mean, I in my work when I was at Disney, I would be in Paris or London or all, all over the world dealing with other Disney facilities and Disney channels all over the world, Singapore. And it's, it's just part of the corporate culture um, of how intensely you feel about this company. Uh, okay. You've been, you, you've built TV studios. Many of them, yes. Approximately how many do you think you've built in L.A.? Um, an assortment of things here, like when Fox um, got the rights to football, mm -hmm. um, I, was, uh, I was brought in to help build out the football release facility in the old Metro Media Center over near Gower Gulch, um, which was a big build out at the time. And I was the young engineer, so I had the 3 p.m. to 3 a.m. shift of managing everyone. <laughs> Gower Gulch is that uh, like Hollywood Boulevard in Gower area? Right. So um, you should know this being from Hollywood. But, Across from the Palladium. Uh, very close to there. Yeah. Very close to the Arby's, if you know where that is. Oh, yes. Right. Um, so <laughs> Gower Gulch got its name because there were so many film and TV production studios there that when you were at one end, like a more southerly end, and you looked up toward the Hollywood sign, you looked like you were in a gulch. You, looked, you were in a valley and surrounded by these tall buildings. Okay. I don't know if you can if you don't if you can't answer this, you don't have to. Sure. Of the TV studios in LA, what's the coolest one? I, th I think that's really difficult to answer because the, the coolness factor, uh, well, there's, as an engineer, you're more focused on like technically what have you been able to achieve. Okay. Um, and then as when you take away your engineer eyes and you say, does this look cool? Does it have a good view? All that kind of no, stuff. No, no, no. I mean like state of the art, like versatility. I, I, I want to get to your level of the engineer part. Because well, to me, the to TV me, studios I've seen don't look cool, but the heart of it is: can well, you do all this stuff? Can you have five cameras in there? Is it big? That kind of thing. So, um, from the places I've worked, I've I've I've, I've worked with uh, Disney and NBC quite a bit, a little bit with Sony. Never worked directly for Fox. So, of those of my personal experience, um, it was impressive when I worked. Um, at Disney ABC to go to West 66th Street in Manhattan and see the ABC studios there. And I thought that was pretty much like, well, that's world news tonight. That's the heart of everything. Mm -hmm. And then after I joined NBC and I went to 30 Rock and I was working a lot of time out of 30 Rock and I got to go have lunch on the Saturday Night Live set of Studio 8H. Nice. And uh, I was there as they rehabbed the uh, grand promenade and the rainbow room and all that stuff. I have to say it's pretty impressive to be in 30 rock next to radio city music hall in the building that they do the tonight show now out of, um, where Saturday night live is. Um, there's a very special feeling when you get to walk beh from behind studio eight H onto the set of Saturday night live and the, comedians and guests are just milling around with you and you're just there to get the free sandwiches <laughs> it is a it is a it, it is definitely a well a, especially a, for guys our age who grew up with snl right who generation after generation we were, were like this season sucks remember <laughs> la rem remember then it seems like every five years people are saying that about well I, I think the uh when i look at it um, comedy changes mm -hmm. um, and your perception of comedy kind of locks in at a certain age, just like your taste in music, right? The music you were listening to, I would say around 19, 20 years old, you've locked into that. That's right. And you're going to love that. You and I love the replacements. We, oh, oh, I 
I didn't realize you did. Oh, hell yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. Big replacements fan. Um, but that music of that era, like you're just wired to it. And I yeah. think comedy has a certain thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, I grew up, my parents would let us watch Monty Python. Mm -hmm. And that absurdist level of comedy <laughs> is what's locked into me is what's funny. Yeah. And uh, Sign Out Live had a lot of that early absurdist com comedy with like uh, Jim Belu or John Belushi as uh, the samurai, samurai optometrist, all that kind of just crazy <laughs> stuff. Land Shark, all that era of thing, right? So I love that kind of comedy. Now, as yeah. comedy trends go in and out, it may fade away from what I think is funny. So while Seinfeld may be the top of the comedy food chain for a decade or so, mm -hmm. it may not be a comedy style that really appeals to me, right? My question, though, was about LA TV studios. And I understand that they've got some fancy stuff in New York City. They should. They had a head start. Is there anything in LA that can compare to 30 Rock or World News Tonight? Maybe not. Not not, not really. I think um, there's film studios here in LA and there's nothing like walking the lot at Disney. There's nothing like walking the lot at Sony. Um, the Warner Brothers lot is nice. It doesn't feel the same. Universal Studios, obviously, I can take a golf cart and go park in front of uh, the Back to the Future uh, clock tower. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to pure TV... Um, Not really. Uh, well, I think um, the NFL used to have a studio out uh, on the west side somewhere, I think, Marina yeah. Del Rey. Marie Dorea, Culver City. Uh, I thought it was just West LA on. Uh, I can't remember. Is it Lincoln? No, it's not Lincoln. It's like um, I know what you're saying. I think Bundy. Could be. So they had a big facility there. Was when the NFL really got into television. That's right. And they built out. Good studios. Day LA used to shoot out of there. Right. So uh, I interviewed there and uh, got to see the whole place, and that was really impressive because the NFL, as you know is filthy rich full of billionaires. And they're on something that they think they're gonna make more billions on, they spent a ton of money on that facility. Right. And I think they've now picked up out of there and I think they're moving to next to the SoFi Stadium. There's a huge NFL building there. Oh. So I don't know if they've moved the TV facilities there, but that would probably make sense for them. But yeah. uh, very similar to being uh, when I was with Disney and could go to ESPN and to sit at the desk of Sports Center. Yes. Uh, very, that's a, you know, Connecticut thing, uh, ESPN. But here in LA, being on the the set where they would do NFL stuff, where Red Zone might be done, yeah, um, that that felt pretty like, oh, this would be great. If uh, if uh, Netflix decides that they want to do live TV, sure. Well, first of all, they need to call you, right? You're the best of your field. Well, in in the kind of stuff I do, facility stuff, right? Oh. Um, it, it, it's shocking to get an engineer to not say no to me. They should call you. Well, sure. I would take their pay. Absolutely. You, um, you'd leave your job where you're at. Are you allowed to do side projects? Not really. Not at the level I'm at. Damn it. Um, so you'd have to leave. Well, I'm, um, you know, uh, <laughs> money makes the world go round. <laughs> Anyone that tells you otherwise, uh, is not telling the truth. Uh, ev everyone has their price unless you already have that FU money, right? So I don't have the FU money. So for the right price, you know, I would definitely switch. I envision Netflix having live TV at some point. Don't you? Very little stuff is live these days, right? Like you can count on maybe one or two hands the number of live television programs. So almost everything that is very popular um is a show that's been scripted and edited and put through post-production mm -hmm. and prepared. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. That's the majority of what I do. I've done live stuff as well before, but there's only a handful of things, the the voice on NBC <laughs> and uh, America's Got Talent on NBC. Yes. And you've got The Masked Singer on Fox and you've got American Idol. Um, these are a f just a few live things other than sports and news, which are definitely live all the time. Right. Um, but what people love the most is they want to watch The Mandalorian, and that takes them a year getting ready to put out. So they want to watch Game of Thrones. They want to watch The Handmaid's Tale. They want to. Yeah. These things 
take years to produce. A lot of people sitting in front of computer workstations, basically editing, coloring, doing the audio, all of that. Here's what I'm thinking for Netflix, and I hope they're paying attention because I have great ideas. Okay. Their comedy is fantastic. If they hired you to build a studio so that Chappelle and all these people could just do it in-house, it would be great. And then they can use that same studio, because MTV doesn't care anymore, to produce unplugged music. Or even, oh my God, plugged music. Even better. This facility, you could build easily. I could definitely build a facility for them, but that's not how Hollywood works. They would rather use a facility that's already built because it's well, cheaper. It's, it's not about facilities at all. Oh. So um, in my experience, because I'm sure there's some other industry people that are saying this dude is full of crap. <laughs> but as the engineer looking in, what happens is ideas come up in Hollywood and they are pitched. Yeah. And uh, is a famous part of the Hollywood process of pitching an idea for a show or a movie or a series or whatever mm -hmm. that is. And if the people who distribute, whether it's we're a film company or a television network or, or a YouTube or a Netflix or a Hulu, they sometimes have their own internal people that pitch stuff. But the vast majority of things is somebody on the outside had an idea for a show or a film and you, as the distributor, say, I will pay you to make that. Mm -hmm. Go make me that show. Yes. And then the show says, awesome, you're gonna pay me this many millions. I'm gonna go get a studio and some camera people and a script writer and all the things you need to make a TV show and spin up my production company. Mm -hmm. And that production company is there for just that one show and that's how they do it. So it's really convincing the production company, where do you wanna shoot this? So the days of NBC saying, We've got Johnny Carson and we've got a studio. We're going to do it all in house or over. Well, there's still, no, there's still some of that. So there's a little of that. The, the, J Jimmy Fallon shoots the tonight show out of a 30 rock. Does studio. he? Yes. I've never, I've never seen that show. And then Seth Meyers, <laughs> you're just trying to get my goat. Uh, Seth Meyers studio. Uh, same thing for Jimmy. I have seen that one. Jimmy Kimmel on a, a ABC. Okay. So what I'm saying is, I want Netflix to do the same thing. And on top of that, I want them to have a rock room where the replacements can get back together and take audience requests and all that stuff because we're Gen X and I miss music on TV. I miss live music. I need to be spoon fed the new shit too. And YouTube is just too vast for me to know what's good and what's bad. I just feel that there's a, a hole in the system that it doesn't seem like anybody wants to fill, and yet there's Amazon that has deep pockets. There's uh, Netflix, who obviously has deep pockets. Uh, Apple probably has a couple bucks rattling around. And it just seems to me that if there, if you build it, they will come. But but you're telling me no. You got to pitch it, and you got to well, have a production Well, well let's just be company. clear what the business of, of these media companies are, all of them. Yeah. Um, they have two two products. The first and main one is eyeballs, mm -hmm. right? So the product of most media companies is eyeballs that they sell to advertisers. Yes. And this is billions and billions and billions of dollars, and it pays my salary, so I'm not going to degrade it. <laughs> and then the other thing that's ramping up is subscriptions. That's right. Right? So um, you have to have something that people think is a value to get them to pay a subscription. Yeah. So... The, the harsh reality is if it doesn't get a lot of eyeballs or it doesn't get people to pay their subscription, it's not going to go anywhere. That's right. And for you and I, uh, men of a certain age, <laughs> uh, our need to watch live television about bands that are older than us. That never sold any records. That never sold any records <laughs> that hold a special place in our heart because of that one night in Santa Barbara when this thing happened. Uh, there is no financial return on doing things for that. Yeah. So if you want to make money right now, right? Uh, you want a K-pop show? 
There you go. Okay. Um, I don't know the other super popular stuff. <laughs> uh, I like Grimes, but I don't know if she's going to, you right. know. Um, but you have to go where the eyeballs are. Yeah. And you have to go where the subscription fees are. Uh, Mr. Beekeeper, you've been fantastic. You were going to put a beekeeper outfit on me. Yes. Um, so this is where we get to flip the tables. Yeah. And you'll be the one with the microphone in your mouth and getting your reaction as I show you what's inside a beehive. And this is something that I did not expect when I came here. Um, this is a lot of people are trying to compare me to um, Hulhauser, who would have done this very happily and. I'm not, I, I don't want to be the, in a perfect world, you would never even hear my voice in this podcast. It would just be the guests. It's all about the conversation though. I guess, but I don't want to overshadow what's going on. And I know that I'm a, an outrageous person at heart. I try not to be. I want to be like you. I want to be an engineer. I want to just be cool. But my, my brother-in-law is like you. Just super cool, super chill. I don't think... In 10 years, he and I have had a conversation that lasted more than three sentences. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and I wish I could live that kind of like almost Zen life, you know, but that's not me. Well, I'm just going to broaden your horizons. Yes, you give, are. Give you an experience you've never had before. Am I probably going to get stung? No, you shouldn't get stung. I've been stung once before. Okay. It didn't kill me. You probably won't get stung. We'll put you in all the good gear. All right. I appreciate you doing this, and uh, stay tuned, everybody. All right, here we go. Okay, so we are back from our excursion in your backyard. My heart's beating a little bit right now. When you started this, yes, you didn't have four boxes back there. What do you call those boxes? Hive boxes. A hive. Yeah, hive. How many hives did you start with? Just one. One box. Yeah. Did you have all the the, the equipment that, that I had the protective gear and the smoker? Yeah. Well, what? Let me just turn this around. So, okay. uh, when we walked away yeah. from the hives for your first time seeing inside a, a beehive, yeah, I said. Is this what you expected? And you said, no, not at all. No, because um, you, first of all, you're a great uh, tour guide back there. Um, I just thought foolishly that every hive is the same, that the going ons in there are the same. And you showed me a couple of things that I didn't expect. You showed me where the babies are being made. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Which is a weird thing to even think about. I don't even know why I didn't think that. I don't even know how I thought bees were made. Um, I, I guess I just assumed that every honeycomb is just making honeys. Honey's being made in there. Yeah. And you showed me that's not the case. You also showed me that that bees don't live very long. And when they die... Some of the other bees drag them the hell away from the beehive. It's not cool to have dead bees. You also showed me a little spot where um, maybe a new queen is going to appear. And you could see how different that looked than the rest it of the did look, It did look different. And that's kind of cool. It's kind of cool because I just always assumed that bees were super duper loyal to the queen and they would never <laughs> make another queen or be upset that the queen wasn't making enough babies. Is that what the queen does? Well, that's all she does. She doesn't make any honey. No. Interesting. All she does is go from cell to cell laying eggs. I also was surprised at how effective the smoke was and how little smoke you really needed for that. And also that... The bees didn't really want me there. They're racist bees. Well, again, I'll speak up for the bees. I, I don't think they think. I don't think they were making any choices. You might have looked like a giant bear to them like oh. I do as well. And they said, hey, uh, somewhere in my bee instinct, uh, we don't like bears. 
but that's about it. Does the uh, th- does the white help? Uh, uh, we were in white. You, you have a long sleeve shirt that says "This is my beekeeping shirt," and I was wearing more of a space suit. Is white something that they don't really so the, want? So the conventional wisdom, which is yet to be scientifically proved, is bees are more aggressive toward dark colors. Oh, oh, so oh. they are racist. <laughs> they are interesting. Yes. Okay. Is this your case proved? <laughs> Ipso facto. Hey, man, they don't sting white. Okay. Did you get stung today? I was wearing white. Okay. And no, I didn't. Thank you. But you felt safe in the gear. I felt safe next to you. Okay. Because you're a reasonable person who knows what the hell you're doing. It's also weird. Okay. I'll tell you this though. It didn't seem like those four boxes really had a hundred thousand bees in them. Yes. It's very densely populated back okay. there. Um, but I'll take your word for it. All right. All right. Well, if you say there's a hundred thousand in there, then there's a hundred thousand. Who the hell am I? I guess my point is, is a guy could have a million bees in his backyard and to the untrained arm eye, it doesn't seem like a lot. Yeah, exactly. So we got to be careful. Thank you so much for everything. And by the way, thank you for protecting us from bees that are in uh, water meters. My pleasure. People can find you on TikTok at Croftbox. C R U F T box. Yes. What does cruft stand for? Uh, cruft is an old engineering term. Oh. Uh, and it kind of referred, it was from the cruft laboratory at MIT. And it refers to a hodgepodge of random things. So most people have that drawer in their house where things tend to accumulate. You would refer to that as cruft. We, we called it the junk drawer. So it's like a junk drawer, but to engineers, when you were saying something has a bunch of junk in it, you say there's a bunch of cruft here. It's crufty software code. I love it. Or this system is. So tiktok.com slash cruftbox. Yep. Uh, the same for your YouTube channel? That's my name, Michael Bositeri. My Twitter is cruftbox. Most of the stuff I do online is under cruftbox because I chose that name like 20 something years ago. And uh, what TV show should we be watching to uh, help out your, your real income? Uh, well, I'd very much like you to watch American Song Contest. <laughs> I haven't heard of this. Well, that's is a it fa- new? Uh, it's a, an American version of Eurovision, if you know what Eurovision oh, is. So they- you should be rooting right now for Illinois or California, depending on They're doing it by the states. Yeah, it's a state versus state. This is on TV right now? Yes. He is, he's so upset that I don't know this. <laughs> Well, my job is in marketing so that we have failed to reach the key demographic. I am not the key demographic. I, I think you kind of are. I am? Sure. You're not You're not a young whippersnapper. And that's who they're shooting at? Well, they're more likely to sit through live television than the Gen Z. Yeah, that's true. But we do have a K-pop person from Oklahoma, which is very exciting. <laughs> Michael, thank you so much for everything. It's a pleasure. How great was Mr. Cruftbox? You know who we think are sweet as honey? Our Patreons. When you stoke us, you're saying, Tony, Jordan, here's a pack of baseball cards. Here's a box of baseball cards. Here's a rookie auto of Shohei Otani. Every donation you hand over helps us keep this insane a project a rolling. So shout out to our Patreons, Nancy Rommelman, Sean Atlow, Matt Mills, Sean Wallace, Greg and Molly, Jamie Taylor, Mark Johnson, Kira Ann, Barney Granke, Ben Welsh, Henry Furman, Jen Adams, The Lonely Chair, Trevor Wilson, Bree Wild, and Dougie Gyro. Want to hear your name at the end of next week's show? Go to patreon.com slash here in LA and give till it hurts. Also, shout out to our Angelinos. To be an Angelino, all you got to do is PayPal us 25 bucks or more, and we will list you in the Here in LA website that Mark Johnson is almost finished with. Actually, I've got to do the finishing now. It's my part. You'll also be given a number to denote how early you got in to make this dream come alive. Angelino number one is Allie Miller. Two, George Wright. 
three, Rita Joanne, four, Jason Sutter, five, Grant Houghton, six, Rob Baker, seven, Kev Chang, eight, Brenda Garcia, nine, John Griffiths. Just PayPal your hard-earned cash to busblog at gmail.com. Want to support us, but that payment from Gavin Newsom just dropped from 1000 to 600 to 200 You can still help. Post your favorite episode on your Facebook. Oh my God, post two. Tweet something nice about this. Anytime you see me tweet about an episode, retweet it. And for God's sake, tell your friends. Tell your friends that we've done almost 50 episodes of this thing. Tell them how it's spelled and that it's on Apple Podcasts and Google and even Spotify. Here in L.A. is produced by myself, Tony Pierce, and a man who can tell you the difference between a B-flat and an A-sharp, Jordan Katz. Editing, mixing, and music supervision by Jordan Katz. Songs by Orgon and Jordan Katz. Special thanks to Cindy for creating the logo, Jen for inspiring this, and the replacements for making some of the greatest music ever. Take a shower, take a shower, take a shower, 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 sh